Good afternoon, all. Um, my name is Richard Brown from the National Cybersecurity Centre here in Ireland, and welcome to a, another IIEA afternoon session. This afternoon, we have a particularly interesting one. Um, we have Johan Lepassar from ANISA, the European Network and Information Security Agency. For those of you who aren't aware, ANISA have been around for more than 15 years now, but in the last year and a half, they've gotten a much more well, a dramatically expanded mandate and a set of new roles. And they've also been put on a, a much more firm uh, organizational footing within the commission structure. Um, it's interesting uh, for a number of different reasons to have ANISA present at such a level uh, on a day like today, because they've taken their place in a very complex set of organizations, both within the EU structures and without. ANISA has a role within um, dealing with a number of different aspects of cybersecurity, both in terms of technical advice and support, and in terms of organizing and structuring the, the collective response to cybersecurity incidents. But in doing so, they play a role along with a large number of other European and non-European entities, including, um, for example, within Europe, the OSCE and NATO, um, and on a global level, the UN. Um, so ANISA are stepping into a very crowded field with a lot of entities uh, who play long-standing very firm roles, many of them with national security components, which makes ANISA's role particularly challenging. Mr. Lepassar is going to talk today about largely about the EU cyber crisis cooperation framework, which is a critical uh, part of the EU's collective response to cybersecurity incidents, particularly large scale cybersecurity incidents. Um, Mr. Lepassar is going to speak to a set of slides, which we'll come to in a second. After that, we'll take some questions. I have some, and I'm sure people on the panel will as well. Um, so we look forward to hearing Mr. Lepassar's uh, comments and taking questions thereafter. Johan, please. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, um, I don't know, it's afternoon in Ireland as well. Um, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss uh, the uh, EU's corporate uh, response to large-scale large, large scale, uh, cross-border cyber crisis, but also to look at what the framework uh, for this response in the EU is now, how it has developed, who are the actors, and what is the role of the agency. So I want to thank Richard for this very good introduction. Um, uh, however, I just have to make one caveat. Uh, now, uh, I do... Uh, the, the presentation as, as well as I can, but I also invited two of my colleagues uh, to join me. So I have Demosthenes Oikonomo, who is the head of uh, operational security in ENISA. Uh, so if you have very detailed or uh, specific questions, I hope that Demosthenes can, uh, can also help me and assist me to, to answer them. Uh, and I also have Laura Hovnik, who is actually, uh, despite the Belgian name, uh, self-identifies herself as an Irish uh, woman. So uh, uh, I have a local, let's say, uh, bridgehead as well uh, in Enisa from Ireland. So if you don't mind, I will just go uh, straight to the presentation and uh, we can have a Q&A as Richard uh, uh, proposed afterward. So I'll try to share my slides. I hope that everybody sees them, uh, please. I hope it works fine, Johan. It works fine. E excellent. So, uh, in the last uh, five or six years, uh, let's say, the EU has taken quite a lot of steps forward in, uh, in order to secure the European sp cyberspace. And uh, I've just used two quotes from the previous President of the European uh, Commission and the current president of the European Commission to showcase that uh, there has been a big priority from the political level of the EU to look at cybersecurity and look at what Europe can do in order to boost our resilience and make sure that uh, we improve information sharing, not only between member states, but between different actors in the field. And we build up step-by-step step, a collective incidents response involving the member states but also the EU actors. So you have the quote from uh, Jean-Claude uh, Juncker from Tallinn Digital Summit that was held in, in September 2017. And then two years later, uh, a quote from President Ursula von der Leyen, both highlighting the need for more cybersecurity at, uh, at, uh, at the European level and President von der Leyen also uh, making a call for an enhanced European cybersecurity agency. 
Uh, the EU framework was built up during the past five years uh, and it involves a number of legislative uh, pillars, I would say. Yeah? So we have the Cybersecurity Act that entered into force uh, last summer, 2019, as Richard said, this brought about a huge expansion of the mandate of the EU Cybersecurity Agency. Uh, but we also do have the NIS Directive, so the Network Information Security Directive, uh, that looks at critical infrastructure of Europe and how it should be protected from, from the point of view of cybersecurity. The NIS Directive entered into force as well uh, in 2018. It was uh, adopted by the Member States in the Parliament in 2016. And what the NIS Directive does, it essentially establishes a kind of a risk management framework for these critical sectors. But it also, uh, and I think uh, I'll, I'll go through it afterwards as well, it also establishes a network of national uh, computer emergency response teams. And this network has really become an instrumental uh, pillar of, uh, of European cyber crisis response. Um, recently, and in parallel with the Cybersecurity Act, the Commission also launched a blueprint, which is a, uh, a kind of a framework for coordinated response to large-scale cybersecurity incidents and crises, trying to pinpoint the different layers of uh, cooperation and how they should uh, synergize their actions. And we also have the cyber diplomacy toolbox and I think that's quite uh, famous as well has been used in order to uh, it could be used also in order to uh, impose sanctions uh, as a response to cybersecurity attacks however today I will focus on the three uh, main let's say uh, legislative uh, uh, pillars plus the blueprint. So I look at the cybersecurity tech, the NIS directive, uh, and the and the political framework. I mean, not so much look at the cyber diplomacy toolbox, partly because the mandate of ENISA is really focused on the internal market. So when we talk about challenges for cyber cyber crisis management, of course, at the union level, the, one of the big challenges that Richard alluded in uh, as well is that. Uh, Cybersecurity is part of, uh, of a national security dimension. And of course, that means that member states uh, play a key role and an important role which should be recognized by all other actors. Um, however, I think it recently member states also have understood that this, uh, uh, let's say, the effectiveness of, of a cybersecurity response at the national level depends on the effectiveness of the overall framework at the European level. So let's say 15 years ago, there was a tangible tension uh, between uh, uh, the operational uh, cooperation elements um, uh, in, the, in the national level and the union level. Uh, this, I wouldn't say that it has disappeared completely, but there is uh, more and more willingness to cooperate at the union level and they're more and more understanding uh, the, the, the need for it. However, on top of it, of course, when we look at the specific challenges for cyber crisis management, then one of the biggest issues is that it requires continuous vigilance, 24-7 uh, understanding of the terrain and the developments on the terrain. Uh, the second big issue is, of course, trust between different communities and stakeholders that are involved. And this trust needs to be built day by day uh, through collaboration. Uh, third big issue is uh, information uh, flow, but also the way that information is gathered and uh, synthesized and the requirements for this uh, on and the different layers that operate within the cyber crisis management. So we normally, uh, differentiate between technical, operational, and political uh, layers. And of course, finally, the big uh, issue in, in this complex environment is as well to avoid duplication of efforts. There are a number of factors and there are a number of players involved. So how to do that? So these are the, let's say, at the outset, uh, uh, the, the main uh, big challenges. And now I would like to just uh, uh, talk you through uh, the actors and, and, and the framework in more a specific uh, format. So when we look at the EU cyber uh, 
uh, crisis collaboration, who are the players at the different levels? So first we look at the technical level. So, and as I mentioned, uh, there the, the baseline or let's say the, the, the foundation is the computer security incident response teams, uh, which are formed nationally. And when they collaborate, they are called uh, the CSERT network. So this is really uh, the, the experts, uh, uh, you can call it the nucleus of uh, European cyber army. Uh, they are the, at the forefront of any kind of an incident nationally, but also at the Europe, European level. We do also have the computer emergency response team for the EU institutions, bodies, and agencies, the SOTU. They are part of the technical level, but they're also part of the operational level because they have also a role in the blueprint. Now, when it comes to the operational level, of course, the agency now with the Cybersecurity Act has a very clear mandate uh, to uh, support and synergize uh, the activities of different actors at the operational level. Uh, we have the European Commission services like the CERT EU, uh, but also DigiConnect, the DigiDigit. Uh, we have the Cyber Crisis Liaison Organization Network, which is called Cyclone. And the Cyclone Group is essentially is the network of national cybersecurity authorities like the BSI in uh, Germany or ANSI in France, or where Richard belongs to in Ireland. Then we have the EU INSEN, which is the European Union Intelligence Institution Center. It's an intelligence body of the uh, external action service at the European level uh, that provides um, uh, insight and cyber awareness. And then of course, uh, there is European Cybercrime Center, the EC3 in the Netherlands attached to Europol, uh, which coordinates cross-border law enforcement activities against cybercrime. Uh, and the, at the political level, of course, we have the European Commission in form of the College of Commissioners. We have the European Council and the Council of Ministers at the EU uh, that can be convened. We have the European Union uh, External Action Service and finally, of course, the Integrated Political Crisis Response Mechanism. So quite a lot of players and layers uh, and how they all interact. Uh, that's the uh, slide that I try to uh, explain uh, now. Of course, in the in the in the nucleus of it is the is the content of any kind of uh, cyber collaboration, which means that how do we observe uh, the cyber ecosystem? How do we orientate ourselves? How do we make decisions at the European level? And how do we act? And all these different layers have a, a role to play. And an effective preparedness entails the adequate support to the existing cybersecurity bodies uh, in order to accomplish these missions. The three-layer structured approach of cyber crisis response in the uh, blueprint uh, essentially looks at the technical, operational, and political level. And it recognizes that all these levels and all these actors have their uh, different areas of activity, but they are interdependent. And that's what the blueprint tries to uh, accomplish is that the interdependence means that we need to collaborate and collaborate among three main issues. Firstly, to create common situational awareness. Secondly, uh, look at how we can uh, coordinate our response to any kind of a cyber crisis. And finally, also how, how we communicate coherently to the European public regarding uh, crises which are cross-border and at large scale. So these are the aims of, of the blueprint. And of course, this is something that the uh, agency uh, tries to uh, assist in. And we do that in, in a number of ways, but the main issue is of course exercises. So uh, these are the, the, the let's say the, the best way how to how to bring all the actors together and how to test the capabilities and their capacities to to uh, collaborate and, and cooperate with each other. Uh, so we have actually two exercises foreseen for uh, uh, for the next uh, six months. One for the for the cyclone group that will happen uh, end of September, uh, where also Ireland will participate. Uh, and the other one to look at building the standard operational procedures uh, on operational cooperation reaching the political level uh, and covering also communications at the end of November. So this is something uh, very tangible that uh, ENISA does. 
Now the question, of course, is how ENISA or the agency itself is positioned vis-a-vis -vis all these uh, actors. We do act as a secretariat for the cycling group. Uh, we give them active support uh, for cyber crisis coordination, but also help them to create this situation awareness. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the CSERT community, we also play the role of the secretariat and we, we again, uh, support them for incident coordination and, and, and creation of a common situation awareness. Vis-a-vis -vis the commission, uh, we of course assist and advise them uh, as regards to uh, developments in the cybersecurity field uh, and uh, and the third EU. This is something that I'll come back to. Uh, I would call it, uh, a, let's say, a structured cooperation framework between any and third EU that is now being built up which is not only about situational awareness, but also about capacity building and how to provide better technical assistance to member states. So all these roles were strengthened uh, with the Cybersecurity Act that entered into force 2019. And I just referred to one article, and I think it's a con constant theme in this operational cooperation field, it's the article seven, which gives ENISA the mandate uh, to cooperate at the operational uh, level and establish synergies between EU bodies and, and uh, agencies uh, and, and actors, but also between EU and national level, uh, especially when it comes to exchange of know-how and best practices, but also provision of advice and guidelines uh, so that uh, when crisis hit, uh, everybody knows what their role is, and to establish practical arrangements in order to arrangements uh, in order to um, uh, make sure that uh, in times of crisis we do have uh, standard operational procedures ready. Um, now I would like to perhaps uh, go in a few more details on about the CSET network which as I mentioned was established by the NIS directive in order to contribute to developing confidence and trust between the member states and to promote swift and effective cooperation, operational cooperation. Uh, we currently have uh, more than uh, 39 incident response teams which have been appointed into the CSET network and we have more than 250 team members registered in the CSET network infrastructure. They've held uh, more than 11 meetings, plenary meetings, and these kind of um, regular um, network has actually been very, very helpful in building the operational cooperation uh, and operational response capacities at the union level. They exchange information, they build consistently trust, they improve the handling of, of cross-border incidents, and also they, they discuss among themselves how to respond in a coordinated manner to specific incidents. Um, what we did, for example, during the COVID-19 is that the CSERT network was put on alert mode and that was very, very helpful for all parties involved. Um, uh, because the level of information sharing at, at the, between the technical experts uh, is something that uh, really enables member states to prepare better for any kind of uh, potential incidents. Uh, ENISA, as I mentioned as well, it has a number of roles vis-a-vis the CSET network. We play the role of the secretariat, uh, but uh, of course uh, there are so so so. So the little honeycombs that you see, they try to uh, uh, essentially uh, summarize uh, the different roles of Venisa vis-a-vis the CSERT network. Um, um, so we, we do help them in organizational and technical matters. We, we help them in, uh, in uh, developing the standard oper operating procedures. Uh, we also keep uh, a liaise uh, uh, the CSET network with the cooperation group that was uh, created uh, via the NIS directive. Um, so perhaps a few words about the, the COVID-19 uh, situation. Now, we did not see um, a cross-border large-scale cyber crisis which was related to COVID-19. We did see an uptick of uh, cyber incidents. Uh, for example, there was a 667% increase of phishing attacks, 
uh, health sector as a sector, of course, uh, uh, was was at the forefront of it. Um, but uh, most of it were opportunistic cybercrime. Uh, so we didn't really see uh, uh, huge uh, full-scale cyber crisis in Europe. And partially, I would say that uh, this was due to the fact that the, the CSERT network was put on alert mode and the, and the technical exchange of information and the technical cooperation that has now uh, taken place over uh, more than five years has been very useful in, in building the resilience and building the collaboration between the member states. So, for example, in the, in the COVID-19 context, uh, we also reached out uh, to several of, of the actors that uh, I mentioned in, in this uh, big uh, diagram, uh, so that we bring we brought all these actors together and, and started to uh, exchange weekly information about um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cyber situation. Um, and we, we call them uh, essentially InfoHub reports. Uh, and uh, that was very useful for, for not only for, for, for different uh, actors involved, but also for different sectors uh, to understand better the cyber uh, threat landscape and, and take precautionary steps if necessary. Um, so this COVID-19 uh, also helped us to utilize the situation in order to play through the blueprint uh, and to see how information can be exchanged between the different layers, the technical, operational, and political layer. Uh, maybe a few words more about the cooperation between ENISA and CERT EU. This is again something that is foreseen in Article 7, Paragraph 4 of the Cybersecurity Act, which requires ENISA to set up a structured cooperation with the CERT EU in order to assist member states in a number of activities that are related uh, to operational cooperation, like capacity building, uh, but also looking at long-term strategic analysis of cyber threats, uh, or helping or assisting member states in the, in the technical uh, assessment of, of cyber incidents. Uh, that's a, this kind of structured cooperation is now being set up as we speak, essentially. Uh, so both ENISA's and, and CERTI use governance structures are engaged in dialogue in order to uh, set a framework for it. And we hope that uh, in October this year that, that will be endorsed. It will also include uh, a setting up of uh, an office for ENISA in Brussels, so where CERTI use is situated, because that's the uh, the, the best way how we can utilize different synergies in, in these uh, tasks. Uh, and of course, once this office is set up, it could also play a role in, in other future developments vis-a-vis -vis the uh, operational uh, cooperation tasks that are given to ENISA by the Cybersecurity Act. And one of them, of course, is the concept of the Joint Cyber Unit, which is something that the President of the European Commission has outlined um, in the beginning of uh, her mandate. Uh, and indeed, if we look at the, the, the concept of it, uh, it, it is clear that though we have now these two legislative pillars that deal with cybersecurity, we do have the blueprint as, as a political framework for, for looking at how these different actors who are in the field can better cooperate. We do lack a coherent uh, response mechanisms at the European level. Uh, there is a fragmentation in EU uh, response landscape and of course there is also a lack of an overview of, uh, of, of capabilities or skills that could be utilized um, in this response. So the Joint Cyber Unit um, could have a role in, in coordinating and, uh, and uh, bringing uh, the activities together. It could uh, look at the uh, cyber threat intelligence and, and consolidate a single view around it. It can better interlink the technical, operational, and political layers, uh, have a role in, the, in, the, in, in, in rapid reaction. That doesn't mean that it takes over the, the obligations and role of the member states, but really to coordinate uh, any kind of uh, response at the union level. Uh, and it can, uh, act as a platform for cooperation and rapid information exchange between existing cybersecurity bodies. ENISA 
due to the Article 7 uh, mandate, of course, can help in a leading role in setting up the joint cyber units, leveraging also the structured cooperation with the CERTU, but also looking at other um, activities uh, within the mandate of the NISA. And there are quite many. I mean, of course, first, there is the operational cooperation mandate where we support member states with respect to operational cooperation with the CSET network. We provide them with assistance uh, in response to requests uh, if necessary. We also contribute in uh, developing a cooperative response framework for union and member states uh, on, for large scale cross border incidents and crises. But we also do have a number of other tasks uh, which are relevant uh, vis a -vis the joint cyber units and for any kind of uh, EU cyber crisis cooperation framework. Firstly, of course, Article 9, again from the Cybersecurity Act, gives any such task of uh, performing long-term strategic analysis on uh, cyber threats and incidents in order to identify emerging trends and help prevent them, uh, the, these incidents then. We have a huge role in capacity building. Uh, uh, every second year we organize pan-European exercises. Actually this year should have been in the health sector, which due to COVID-19 situation, we, we uh, slightly uh, postponed and, and um, uh, changed. But the fact that uh, this uh, exercise was uh, foreseen to take place that of course help member states also to prepare a bit and look at the capabilities that their health sectors now have. However, in the capacity building, it's not only about exercises. We, we do assist uh, uh, not only EU institutions, but often also member states to improve the, the prevention, detection, analysis of cyber threats and incidents. Uh, and to look at their all their capabilities that they have uh, to respond uh, to such uh, threats and incidents and what, what can be done in order to raise uh, the level uh, of uh, cybersecurity across the fields. Um, so we offer also trainings, but also look at guidelines and best practices. Uh, I mentioned standard operational procedures and etc. We look at skills development as well, for example. Uh, then Article 11, Research and Innovation, we uh, advise the Union and, and the Member States on research needs and priorities with a view to enabling effective response to current emerging risks and cyber threats. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, we have a role also in engaging with the private sector and, and, and building a partnership with, uh, uh, with private sector stakeholders uh, who do uh, have a stake uh, in, in in making sure that Europe, Europe is cyber secure. Uh, now, private sector entities are not part of the formal governance structure. And this is, of course, some something that perhaps in in the context of the giant cyber unit can be uh, this can be addressed further, because for quite often they they are at the front line of uh, of any kind of uh, cyber incidents, uh, whether they are. Uh, um, uh, detecting uh, any kind of malicious behavior in their own networks or, or services, or they see it on the ground. So having a good uh, cooperation, collaboration between the private sector uh, entities and the public sector entities in order to enhance any kind of um, EU cyber crisis cooperation framework would be essential. And I would like to uh, actually finish my presentation here. And I'm very happy to take uh, any kind of a question or, or comment, uh, should you have one. I also would like to ask whether Demosthenes, um, my head of unit for operational security, has anything to add to, to what I've already said. Thank you very much. Ivan, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for a very useful presentation. Um, I, I'll ask people if, if they would to, to put their questions or any questions they may have in the, in the Q&A box. And I'll pick them up as I go along. There's three there already, but I'm going to exercise my uh, my prerogative as chair to ask one very specific one first, and then a few more I'll intersperse as we go on. Um, on the joint uh, the joint cyber unit, um, I mean we know this is very much an ambition of the the new commission and that privy uh, Ms. Van der Leyen on in terms of how how this should come into effect. But I have a very practical question in terms of how it will actually really. Um, improve the response to, to cybersecurity incidents across the European Union. 
for in two ways. I mean, the first thing is from our own operational experience, the speed at which the European Union collective response mechanism can spool up and get ready. I mean, in I mean, you'll remember this from your previous experience during WannaCry, for example, or not Pecha, the national response and our national response was many hours old before the European response woke up, um, and we're not unique in that. Everybody was was ahead of that process, um, trying to coordinate across a large number of member states, some of whom may have very little interest or involvement in an incident, some of whom may be very heavily involved, would be very challenging. The other question I would have around that is, much of the information related to incident response is either national security sensitive, or it is heavily commercially specific. It is a company with a problem, it is an entity with an issue. Um, how, does, how will the Joint Serbia Union, and I know it hasn't been announced yet, we're waiting on the details of it obviously, um, engage with those kinds of challenges in a real-time environment? They're all very pertinent, good questions. I mean, first of all, when it comes to uh, response, um, the let's say the first responders will always be uh, the national authorities. And uh, the Joint Cyber Unit does not aim to take their role away. Uh, um, I think the question is, how do national authorities can respond better um, within with having a knowledge that they are within the European framework and what might happen in the neighborhood might also affect them and how do they gain insight into this information. So the key really is the common situational awareness, the understanding of what goes on and having, uh, let's say, the necessary knowledge uh, and awareness in order to do your job. Uh, which is to respond. Of course, there might be also cases, and we've seen that, um, where coordinated EU response might make sense as well in order to protect critical infrastructure, for example, which is quite often cross-border. So you need some sort of cooperation uh, in there. Uh, and preparing for that and building for that in terms of uh, uh, developing trust between the different players and having the cooperation collaboration mechanisms ready so that they can be utilized if uh, if it's necessary is something that joint cyber unit should aim at so and and this brings added value to what member states are doing and again as i started the big challenge is that as you as you note yourself it is about national security quite often so uh, the, the question there is uh, this is something that we need all to respect uh, and see uh, how we can help member states to take their national security seriously and, and, and essentially act upon it. Thank you. I have two questions from General Ahern on, on the same issue and, and I think uh, his second question is pertinent. He asks, is there an appetite amongst member states to, to form a JCU? I don't answer that on your behalf. It depends. Um, it depends on what it is. Um, I think you and you've already commented on that specifically in terms of exactly what, what the Commission hopes it will bring to bear. Um, there's another question here on, on the UN process. I'll come to that at the end on, on, on the OEWG and the, the current UN processes around cybersecurity and cyber diplomacy. We have a national involvement in that as well, obviously. Um, we have a question here from, from someone on the, the role for cybersecurity rapid response teams working on a cross-border basis. Do you think that could be an outcome of the JCEU? I know some member states historically very much had an interest in that, including member states close to your homeland. Yes, uh, I think it, uh, it could be part of the, the JCEU framework uh, to have a trusted and vetted pool of uh, experts, technicians, who perhaps can be useful to tap into when you have a, a, a crisis back home. Again, uh, there is a limit to this, I mean, and then I mean, in the end of the day, uh, what cybersecurity? I mean, not a cybersecurity engineer myself, but everybody tells me, you know, you don't let other people inside your systems, uh, but you do uh, value advice uh, and a kind of a, a, in a friendly format, let's say, uh, or just have a have a mirror sometimes to reflect whether your activities and actions that you have taken uh, in order to respond uh, are adequate enough. So these kind of things uh, do pop up from time to time. We've had requests from member states uh, to provide assistance. Uh, so we, we, we've seen the need for it. It's, it's not something that is theoretical, it's quite practical. Uh, and to be clear, 
we already have a pool of experts. I mean, we talk about the CSERT network. Huh? So it's 250 technicians. Doesn't seem a big number, but they are very knowledgeable and they know what they're doing and they they do build trust vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other by collaborating and cooperating on a regular basis. And that is what, it, what is necessary. Also, when we look beyond national search, we, we do have sectorial search. And we, we, we have people working within our private sector provide, service providers who also are part of this community. So I think it, it is a bit wider and we, we could find ways how to perhaps organize this community in a way that uh, if uh, sectors or member states are in need, uh, they could, if they themselves request, uh, tap into this resource. Makes perfect sense. I just add to that in terms of the CSERC network. Our experience of it is that it, in and of itself, it's a hugely valuable tool. It's a way of, of exchanging information and making contacts. But where it really comes into its own is in terms of sharing information and best practice offline. So it's the contacts made during the CSERC network meetings yes. that allow you to follow up with tools, specific developments on best practice, on developing new tools to deal with very specific challenges. And it allows member states to network in a very real operational way very quickly. Just to reconfirm something I should have said at the outset, this entire se session is on the record. So obviously everything we say is on the record. Um, those of us working in cybersecurity have to work on that basis anyway, um, unfortunately. The, there's a question there, I mean, from um, Fanaka Shadakawa, I'm missing the name, I'm sorry, on the current UN process to setting norms. It, 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 does Anisa, ha Anisa have a view on how that process is going and where it should end up? I mean, what do you see of the role for the European Union in cyber diplomacy in the future? I mean, it's a key development in terms of sanctions and everything Indeed. else. Um, I think, I mean, uh, we, EU has been quite busy in building up the, the cybersecurity framework uh, internally, I think, and it's very important that we do have not only the Network Information Security Directive, but also Cybersecurity Act, uh, so that we have these legislative pillars. Um, and if we look uh, what EU can achieve when it defends its values uh, globally, I think it, it is something uh, worth noting that, for example, in the context of privacy protection, uh, the EU has been leading in, in terms of establishing certain principles that have now become, I would say global and i think we have an opportunity there also to do a similar similar uh, exercise in cyber security um, now uh, we we do want to have a a, a, a cyberspace that is uh, based on on law and 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 good behavior uh, so the eu and process is a good one but i think in the end of the day what the eu must do is to make sure that uh, we act upon our values and we do promote uh, our understanding of how uh, cyberspace should be utilized and what is acceptable behavior, what is not acceptable behavior. Uh, so it's first, I think we, we do that in the right, uh, let's say sequencing, firstly establishing uh, a clear framework inside Europe and then uh, looking at what happens globally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just add from a purely national perspective, the European Union has made a really, played a really important role in the development of international inter internet governance policy as well. So the European Union, through coordination at ICANN and other international organizations, plays a critical role in developing international norms across the internet in general. Mm -hmm. And cybersecurity is another very good example where it's the coordination function within Europe allows European Union member states pool their collective sway, if you like, on the global stage. And I'm talking about the UN Security Council as well as another example of this and deliver real change. So if you look at as far back as WISIT in 2012, where the European Union and other um, operating as a group and with other interested states managed to preserve the internet in much the way it is right now, free, open and secure. Um, and that challenge is, is not going away as people will be fully aware, unfortunately. Um, switching gears really quickly, Bob Semple um, has asked a, a very specific question of, about board members, public and private. So he asked, how do you assess the level of awareness of board members in understanding and appropriately governing cyber risks, control, resilience in their organizations? Now, for most of you, that's a really asinine question. But for those of us who are unfortunately involved in, in the application of the NIS directive process, and I have a follow-up question on NIS, this is utterly critical. Because one of, the fundamental, one of the fundamental challenges the European Union as a whole is facing in the application of the NAS directive is to ensure a single cohesive level of cybersecurity critical infrastructure. 
we're talking about a small pool of companies at a European level, but it is the ball game. So, Johan, I'd be delighted to hear what you have to say. I mean, I think uh, understanding of how the NIS framework has actually affect the, uh, the actions of companies and whether it has brought change is something that we are now looking at. The agency actually launched in summer um, a call uh, in order to build up a, a study or analysis of how the NIS has triggered investments in the critical uh, sectors, but also looking at more broadly of uh, you know, what is the, as you say, what is the understanding of board members about cybersecurity? Um, I mean, unfortunately, so far, we don't have, or we lack a kind of a regular monitoring tools in order to understand it. But this is something that the agency now wants to develop, kind of an index or uh, a benchmark that you could use in order to uh, look how the cybersecurity uh, has developed, uh, not only over, over the past years, but also how, how will it develop in the future, whether we have managed to increase the overall level of cybersecurity or whether we are still lagging behind in a number of areas. So I don't want to give you the, the content response now because I'm waiting for the outcomes of this study. But this is something that uh, the agency will now probably undertake as a regular exercise and uh, not only on, in terms of investment, but precisely how companies understand the critical uh, elements in the NIS directive, what policies they have adopted to actually bring change about, whether it's followed up by investments, uh, and whether we can actually detect change on the ground as well. Um, I mean, every year we have uh, new stories coming in, and every year the, the story is very similar. More cyber attacks increasing more complex yeah. Yeah. so that doesn't change but what change in terms of response we don't really see that yet i mean we we, we do have some evidence that we become more resilient uh, that we take our role more seriously that there is more systematic approach in order to tackle these issues but we don't we don't have good metrics so that that is something that the agency now wants to develop yeah well again by means of national response first of all i completely agree the um this goes back to the very fact that the nas directive is heterogeneous in its application everybody has their own set of security measures so a single benchmark to, to bob's question is going to be very difficult to define at an anisa level secondly the, there is a real timing issue here for us we're running into a review of the nas directive now but we're only two two and a half years into the application of the directive itself and we're seeing in our own domestic application there's a very varied understanding and bringing everybody up to the same level takes time and it takes the application of audits and legal tools and all of the things you'd imagine. So this is not going to be a simple process. It's going to be an interesting one to discuss in the, in the, in the context of the review and any draft legislation thereafter. Um, switching gears very quickly, we have a specific question here from Irina Leroy about the, um, about the, commu the communication from the Parliament, sorry, from the Commission to the Parliament about the risk of foreign dependence in the, in the IT field. And the question is about cyber autonomy for the critical infrastructure sector. I'll broaden that briefly, if, if you wouldn't mind. There's been a very significant amount of discussion over the last five years, I suppose, in Europe about the idea of European digital strategic autonomy. And writ large, this has a number of implications, potentially, for member states. Um, this is a very sp a specific question about IT. We could, make the, we could make it even more specific and talk about 5G, for example. If you take the discussions we're all having around 5G and Hours have been extant for a long time and we're, we're nearly there to the end of the process now. What does that mean for the rest of IT? What does it mean for cloud computing? What does it mean for the physical infrastructure we rely on to run our other critical infrastructure? And where does this go at a European level? That's a big question, I'm sorry. I think the big uh, framework issue is that Europe should not be naive about its um, strengths nor its weaknesses. And I think we've seen that over the over the past two years, uh, when it comes to the 5G, that we do have, if necessary, we, we can pull our act together and, and find the ways how to transparently and openly, but also, uh, I would say, in, in a way that uh, reflects the protection of European interests and, and values, build up a framework in order to assess any kind of risks in, in new emerging technologies, 
or in existing technologies and also see how these risks then can be mitigated at the national and EU level. So for the 5G, of course, this, is, this has been at the forefront. Um, uh, the 5G risk assessment, which was based on the national risk assessment, uh, was concluded um, uh, last year. We developed the toolbox, which is essentially a, a set of technical, but also strategic measures that can be taken at the national and member state level. And we just recently concluded a, a review, not of the review of the toolbox, but the review to, to understand how this toolbox has been implemented. And we've seen that, of course, things that take time, but once you get uh, the train in motion, you know, the, the general direction is very positive. So you do, take measures both national and at the EU level in order to increase the resilience of, of this future critical uh, framework. Um, so 5G is one area. So how do we operate with others? I think uh, the, the 5G template is not always useful in order to follow other areas. For, but for other, for example, you mentioned cloud, we might have other tools. So ENISA was requested by the Commission to come up with the uh, draft certification framework uh, for cloud service providers. We have been now looking into it over a half a year. We've convened an expert group that does a good work, but uh, and we hope that by the end of the year we will have something more solid uh, ready. So you can also address these let's say gaps or issues via a certification tool. Uh, the certification tool is voluntary, yeah? but there remains the question whether, for example, within the framework of the NIS review, once a European certification framework is established, should the, uh, the operators of such services adopt it? Um, I mean, does it remain a voluntary solution then, or would it be something that is a benchmark that they should follow? Uh, and I think uh, we also will have a discussion whether the cloud service providers will be part of the uh, uh, tier one uh, uh, service providers in the, in, in, in the context of the NIS directive, whether they will become, uh, the, let's say, part of the critical infrastructure uh, in Europe. So we don't have yet all the answers, but we do have the tools in place. And I think what is important is that we also have a very clear policy line, which is not to be naive about it, uh, and, and do adopt measures across the field, across not only within the context of, of, uh, of cybersecurity, but also in the context of how to build competitiveness within the internal market, how to look at our industrial policies, our research and innovation policies, because these are also part of the answer. I tend to agree completely. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot in the question. And that's a very comprehensive answer. Thank you. Um, we had a very specific question here about, about defence um, from Mary Cross, asking if ANISA is contributing through the EAS or otherwise to member states' military capacities in cybersecurity. Um, I think I know the answer, but please. Yeah. Well, ANISA is an internal market agency. So uh, the baseline of my operations is, of course, the internal markets, uh, making sure that we can... Uh, 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 raise the resilience uh, of the products, the services that are put on the internal market, that we make sure that the, that the critical infrastructure that supplies these services from one member state to, to another is, is protected in terms of cybersecurity. We do now have a mandate also in operational cooperation and operational uh, fields. So we do assist and help uh, and coordinate the, any kind of an action between the member states and, and the EU bodies when it comes to uh, response to large scale cross-border crises. And of course, this is an area that touches upon national security, as I mentioned as well. Um, now, we do not act as, as an agency in defense because that's outside of our remit. But we do have a clear understanding of the ecosystem and we do cooperate and, and collaborate uh, with, uh, with the bodies uh, who are involved. Uh, we have a, a memorandum of understanding between the four agencies. Uh, so it's ENISA, it's CERTEU, it's Europol, and it's the European defense agency um, to you know, undertake actions on a yearly basis in order to look at the 
capacity building activities that we do, look at the awareness raising activities that we do, also build up a, a and help to build up the the uh, common awareness uh, across the board. So we do we do this, but we all have our own remits. So I would not say that uh, we act uh, in in the area or in the domain of defence. No, we don't. Excellent. Thank you. Um, if I might, Mary, as well, just to point out, when is cyber military and not military is a very vexed question, and it, it's like let's go with Johan's answer. It covers it very well. Um, a question from, from James Caffrey, and for the purposes of, of transparency, James is, is a staff member in, in the Department of Communications. Um, on digital sovereignty and operational cooperation with, with US multinationals, is there a potential policy impact from a push towards greater European digital strategic autonomy on international cooperation with these companies? And it's particularly challenging when, I mean, potentially you're looking at a situation where Europe might be about requiring member states to put in new certification frameworks on cloud computing and potentially other digital services, and yet at the same time require certain other types of ongoing cooperation and other matters. Hmm. Well, again, I mean, there, there is no, uh, it's, it's a bit of a question whether, whether I believe that uh, uh, the, the rules uh, and the framework that we are building is fair for everybody, or, or uh, will it, if, in case some parties uh, consider it as being detrimental to their interest, would they retaliate? I mean, <laughs> in my point of view, I think we should be um, rather agnostic to this. I mean, we, we, should, we should build a framework that we believe makes sense for us, which is transparent and open, and lets everybody to operate in Europe according to the rules that we set up. So I don't, you know, I don't want to name any third country players, but as long as they follow the rules, and as, fo as long as our risk assessment vis-a-vis -vis them uh, points that there are no big issues, um, I don't see a problem. Uh, um, so, but I think it, it's important to maintain a rule-based uh, cybersecurity framework in Europe uh, in future. But a rule based also, which is not naive. Huh? So we, we, we have seen how third country players have misused some of the gaps that we that are existing in, in, in the framework. And, and that's not for the benefit of European society, nor for European economies. So we, we do need to upgrade and patch the framework you know, for, for, for this to be uh, uh, Top notch and resilient uh, in essence. Uh, so it's it's a kind of a rule based game. Uh, I, 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 you know, some some might not like the rules, but these are the rules. Yeah. I mean, just to to reinforce that, I would agree completely. One of the the real strengths of the European Union that we've all known and understood for a long time is the rule based, transparent nature of its transactions. So if you look at something as as resilient as GDPR, which has had essentially global implications in a very transparent way. Um, it's a really useful example of how the European Union can exert soft power on a global basis. And the same thing applies in cybersecurity, but particularly what's of particular interest in the last while is the extent to which the European Union can operate politically, collectively, when it comes to a challenge like 5G security, whereby there's been maybe not a complete course of a, along the same line, but very, very similar moves by a large number of member states at senior political level around the same end goal, which is greater European autonomy and security. So like the European Union has developed very significantly in, in that regard in the last while, and I agree completely with your response. Along the same line, we have a question in, sorry, Torlok Dinan has made a comment about public health and 5G and disinformation around that being an issue. We might come back to disinformation at the end if we have a minute, but there's a, an interesting question here about, um, about NATO. Andrew Rue has asked about the development of cybersecurity under NATO. He's mentioning the incorporation of cyber threats under, under Chapter 5, I presume Article 5 of the treaty. Um, is the tendency of member states to gravitate towards NATO and the US-led umbrella, um, could that hamper the, the emerging collective effort at a European Union level? Is, there, is this a, a one or the other type situation in your mind? Yeah. Um, I, I, let's say, I mean, for me, cybersecurity is a very practical issue. And it comes down to very uh, specific uh, infrastructure that you have in place or services that you have or, or try to maintain 
and of course part of it is uh, very much linked to to uh, national security and defense but other parts of it are linked to how your economy and society functions so i wouldn't say i wouldn't draw this line of you know member states gravitating more towards nato or eu when it comes to collective cyber response they need to do both uh, and they're doing both and we also have member states who are not part of the nato uh, ireland also so it's 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 a question of uh, of uh, maintaining a, a a good overview and making sure that all the critical sectors and the critical infrastructure is protected at the adequate level yeah, i agree completely um i leave you aside the fact that ireland isn't a member of the european union we, we all have a collective response at a national level to security issues of this type and sometimes they're in our space about resilience and and defense of civilian infrastructure and sometimes they're military and they wear a uniform and it's a it's a different field but very much related to what we do um that's great johan we have taken up an hour of your time um and we're just about done do you have anything else you want to add before we close I don't have anything to add, but uh, I just wanted to um, thank everybody for their very good uh, comments and questions. I think it's a, it's a, it's a moving terrain. Uh, operational response at the union level is something that is very, very new. We are still building it up. So these kinds of exchange of views and, and Q and A's actually, they help also to clarify the picture, but also to understand better what is the added value that the union level action in this field can bring. So thank you very much for, for your comments and questions. And thanks, Richard, for inviting me. Thank you very much, Ivan. And I, I just to reiterate exactly your point, ENISA is a, is a cog in a, in a complex um, set of organizations that play a critical role in the, in the security, not just of the European, but of the services that millions of people's lives depend upon. Um, how we all collectively engage at a European Union level is going to be critical to the development of future security solutions. So, you know, we look forward to working with ANISA both at a working group level in terms of any future legislation, but also operationally. So thank you. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you very much.